third letter end with the A, alright? So I'll, I'll be listening and I'll be screaming and then uh, when I do this, you stop at the next A, right? USA, USA, US stop. Got it? So wait for this. With me? And then I'm going to say, we are World Regions of Virginia Tech. And we approve of this message. <laughs> Which brings me to this digital request. 
Now, I know you are super busy out there on the campaign trail, but we want to personally invite you onto our campus and into this classroom to have a conversation about the often ignored but vitally important issues facing America internationally, and also to get your vision for the future of the United States in the globalized 21st century. Now, we don't want no standardized campaign stump speeches. Uh -uh. We want the real thing, because these students are fired up about foreign policy and the future of America. But don't take my word for it. Just ask the class. <laughs>
And that's a great thing about having such a huge class. You can make uh, what uh, comments that would otherwise be like sexual harassment, but how can you sexually harass 3,000 people one time? <laughs> so you didn't have a reference to over here. Not really. All right. <laughs> okay. I have a question for you. Dude, it's like a billion degrees in here. Billion, trillion degrees. Contract. 
your, e, your TAs have already emailed you about turning in the course contracts directly to them. And do keep up with your grades. This is college now. Uh, for you upper class, you know this already. For incoming freshmen, this is college. In high school, for all your life up to this point, uh, mom and dad told you what to do, where to go, and how to dress, and people in your school and high school said you need to come to class, you have to be here, right? We're going to hit your ass with a ruler and take your detention. That shit's over. This is college. So for you now, nobody's going to come check up on you. I would like to say I can do everything I can to connect with you and help you out, but it's really up to you. You got to take care of your shit. This is the real world. It starts here, right? This class is the ultimate test of if you're ready for college or not. If you fail this class, I mean fail. I mean to see. I mean, if you fail this class, try to reconsider the old college set. <laughs> I'm not being facetious because this class is putting the burden on your shoulders, and if you can't take care of it without somebody telling you to do it, you're probably not going to do well in your four years here, or eight years, or however long it takes you. Okay? So just a word to the box. Uh, I did want to at least get to some of the other tools in our toolbox for what we're going to be talking about doing in this course, all right? This guy's doing a hell of a job of paying the contract. You better be imagine how good this feels. I mean, like, up there, there's like angels behind me. This is great. All right, uh, tools in our first toolbox. We will be, of course, talking about in the news. Uh, current events, podcasts, lots of stuff. You know, we talk about in class, talk about in podcasts, talk about anywhere else. It's in current and in the news. It's possible exam material. Uh, so do keep up with what's going on on the planet. And if you're in the forums assignment, you're going to be doing this already. Because the entire world out there is affecting us. That's the whole point of the class. Just a few news stories from around the globe. Some of these I pointed out last week. That uh, Vice President Joe Biden says, China! Wow, I forgot. Thank you. Uh, China! <laughs> The United States share global responsibilities. Again, this is the era in which we live. The U.S. is saying, oh yeah, 10 years, 20, 20 years ago, we were number one, we care about China. It is a different world. We, shit, we know you guys are rising power. You guys have as much responsibility as we do now. Come on, you're a player like we are. Uh, also, in more current, current events, uh, just last week, Hurricane Isaac flooded New Orleans and other coastal cities and almost preempted the Republican National Convention. Luckily, it missed Florida and slammed it back into New Orleans and just the target of hurricanes, apparently, right? However, I don't want you to pay attention to U.S. news. In fact, I care less about U.S. news. I'm more interested in what's going on in the world. But I can make a tie here in current events. Did you know that hurricanes have a distinct season? Everybody knows that, right? We're in hurricane season. Did you also know that other parts of the planet have the exact same phenomenon? In fact, in the Pacific Ocean, they have the exact same hurricane season at the exact same time with hygienic storms of the exact same magnitude, but they call them typhoons. Seems like a test question already. Hurricane equals typhoon. In our part of the world, we call them hurricanes. In the Pacific, they call them typhoons. And actually, in India, in, uh, in the Indian Ocean, what do they call them there? Cyclones, all right? We actually call cyclones tornadoes here, right? But cyclones in the Indian Ocean, typhoons in the Pacific. And here's what I wanted to know, current events going on right this semester. We're like, oh, no, hurricane's rising. It hit your leaves. That's terrible. It caused the damage to bloody. Dudes, dudettes, the Pacific has been getting body slammed with typhoons this semester. Absolutely body slammed. Isaac is pissing a bucket compared to typhoons that have been slamming all up and down the east coast of Asia. From North Korea and South Korea to Japan, all the way up to China and Indonesia. It's been heavy, heavy typhoon season. And this is just a track. This is last time, this time last week, a typhoon, the fifth or sixth or seventh of the season, was slamming into Okinawa and heading north towards Japan. North Korea has already had gigantic flooding problems due to a huge typhoon that hit there. Uh, so this is just a track of the major, major typhoons that have hit uh, east coast of Asia this typhoon slash hurricane season. Cool? So now you have something about another part of the world, because it's exactly like here, but it's there. Got it? Same seasonal shifts, same 
same seasonal patterns on the eastern seaboard of Asia. And now you know something through relation. Cool? What other news stories do we have? This is one, of course, that's been hot all over the place for going on over a year now. And this is whole, this whole Syrian situation. It's devolved into a civil war and chaos, and there's refugees fleeing in all directions. And the point I want to make with this slide is not describe the whole Syrian conflict. We can do that later in another class if you want. It's up to you. Okay? But what I wanted to point out is that this is, does anybody know this guy is? President al-Assad of Syria. You'll know him by the end of the semester if he's still alive. All right? Uh, he is the president of Syria who's crushing this rebel uprising to take over the country, all right, bring democracy there. And what he said in his own words, and I think what you remember is, he says, we are fighting a regional and global war, period. That's all I want you to understand. Even the guy there is saying, huh, this isn't a civil war. This is a regional and global war, and I agree with him. It is. That's why it's important. This isn't a bunch of Syrians fighting another bunch of Syrians. This is every country in the vicinity, including Saudi Arabia, other Arabian countries, uh, Turkey, uh, perhaps Israel. Everybody has a finger in this pie of this civil war. And guess what? So does your country, too. So does NATO. So do the European countries. This particular single conflict it actually is a global conflict. This is exactly what I'm talking about here in the 21st century. Nothing is isolated anymore. There's no single isolated civil wars. There's tons of players behind the scenes supporting different sides. And that's what's happening here. Okay? This is a global war. We don't know what the ending's going to be. But whatever happens, it's going to impact the region and the globe. In a big way. All right, you should probably, you should probably get a taste of this. All right, other news stories that I do want you to kind of think about. Uh, all this plot is terrible. Uh, a, rep, uh, a reputed top leader of Gulf Cartel is captured in Mexico. Does anybody know there's a huge war going on in Mexico? <laughs> Good! I'm still really terrified that most Americans don't know that there's a gigantic war caused in part by Americans' uh, 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 penchant for taking tons of drugs <laughs> that's fueling a gigantic war in Mexico between different drug cartels and the Mexican government and everybody else, and it's seeping into the United States. This is a global thing. So a news story from just a couple days ago, they arrested one of the top guys of this gold cartel, which is just across the border from Texas, and let's be honest, there's probably gold cartel members in Texas, and there's probably gold cartel muscle all across the United States. These drug cartel guys actually use Central American gangs now as their enforcer on the street. Have you ever heard of MS-13? Yeah. How many people have seen an MS-13 person in their hometown, wherever you're from? That is scary as shit, right? These are ruthless gangs that are the muscle for Mexican drug cartels, and people in this room have seen them in the United States. You think this is a Mexican problem? Better check the camp. This is a global, definitely a regional and a global issue, right? And for those of you that know nothing about it, these drug cartels are fighting each other for territorial control over the drug routes, bringing all that wonderful cocaine and marijuana that everybody loves in America into the United States. Uh, and the Mexican government, in an effort to stop them, has started fighting them. And so now it's a Mexican standoff between all parties who are all shooting at each other in broad daylight. This is a mess in Mexico that does impact your life here in a big way. Right, these are just a handful of the cartels and the territories they control. Uh, and finally, I always like to uh, stay in the reason for one more and talk about our other neighbors in the hood. Canada troops need arrest. Canadian troops have been worn out by international commitments, mostly in Afghanistan, and need arrest.
you have no clue what we're talking about, you need to buy this super damn thing, open up the cover, and go to the site that tells you all of that's wrong, actually phone a friend and find out the right site, and get in. This is where all the tests and quizzes and all that stuff is, and we've already done all this stuff, so we don't have to care about that. Did you have a question, man? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, so we have the goofiest textbook ever. I think some of you are enjoying the textbook already. Some of you have tweeted and emailed me. Thank you so much. It's awesome. Uh, yes, sir. Did I make the textbook? Yeah. No, it's not a thing. You made the textbook. I know the guy. We went to college together. But he's kind of a loose cannon. Would you like to let me to come to class sometime? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll let him take one of the lectures when I'm out of town. Oh, by the way, has anybody looked at the schedule of this class? Do you realize that we have a class on Halloween? Justin's done, that's fine by me. 
Since we're early on in the semester, we haven't gotten into the antics of some of the nastier world leaders and people on planet Earth. I just went out on a limb and said, I've heard about this in passing that maybe we'll make uh, uh, not Charlie Sheen, all right? Charlie Sheen won last year uh, because he was winning. But this year, since Charlie's pretty casual, I figured we'd go for a real bastard like <laughs> Reserves. 
If any of the reserves die, I'll allow you to select the reserve and put it over top of any square. Does that make sense? So here is the board I put together, and this is logical, it's just not goofy and cynical and disturbing. Uh, because there are leaders around the world that I want you to have. And I want you to understand that some of them might not survive the semester. And I want you to know why. Uh, some of these folks are way old. Uh, some of them are uh, in poor health. But the majority of them are in countries that have very dangerous circumstances going on. And they are at risk of assassination in a very big way. You're going to know all these people at the end of the semester. And you're going to know why they're on the death watch. So if you have any nominations, from now until next week, email me, and then we'll figure out a way to put them into the board. Does that make sense? We'll lock down the board after next week, and then the game is over. Got it? And again, I feel good about this semester. I put a side in center square court. He is at high risk of dying, right? Of being worm food in a very big way. And Fidel Castro has been on the death list for 20 years. <laughs> He's been on the CIA death watch for 50 years, right? <laughs> this guy has to die eventually, and this could be this semester. So it's a, it's a pretty decent looking board, actually, if you're really morbid. And I think Mark may be with you as well, all right? So we won't call out any now, but if you think about them from now to next week, hit me up, and we'll see if we can work them in. Uh, and I'm not going to read all this stuff because we've already talked about it, too. Uh, for those of you that are first time in here, we have Wednesday lectures. Everything is streamed live through this camera right here uh, and hopefully recorded properly. So if you miss a class or you want to re-review a class, it should be posted online. Uh, I would encourage you to keep coming to class because it's fun. Uh, and it does get cooler, trust me. Once October hits, it'll be nice in here, not a steam bath. Uh, we have all online live office hours every Sunday night. I usually send out a message about that, the blog, we talk about textbooks, blah, 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 everything's on the course count. Cool? Okay, good. Our main tool, however, to understand the world is what the class is named. World Regents. The region is the, the concept. It's the structure. It's how we are going to approach the entire planet and try to understand it. Because the world's a gigantic place. And there's 10 trillion things going on. And 7.5 billion people all doing their thing. And a couple hundred countries all doing their own thing. And all this stuff is going on. You can't understand it all. So what we're going to do is look at the Earth through this lens of a regional context to try to make sense of important features all over the planet to help you understand what's happening for the rest of your lives, not just shit for a test in this class at the end of the semester. We care less about that. Okay? So the main tool is the region. These are my regions, the regions that survive in the textbook. But here's the question, what's a region? For those of you who have already read ahead, now's your time to show how smart you are. What is a region? Classical world regions, what is it? Actually, it has three different components. Yes, what's a component of a region? What do you need to have a region? Sure, physical characteristics. Maybe some characteristics, uh, maybe things simple enough. What else do you need? Area. Some area. You gotta have some area. Number one, area. You gotta have some space. You can't have a region if you're a dot, alright? For some space. What else do you need? Common cultural or physical traits. Maybe some common cultural or physical traits. What's the other one thing? Boundaries. Boundaries. You gotta have some edges. So you need some area. It can be a small area, it can be a gigantic area. You need some edges around that area or boundaries, and you should jot this down too. Those boundaries can be very solid, very legally defined boundaries, or, or they can be very fuzzy boundaries. Does that make sense? So boundaries can be very strict, identified and defined, or very fuzzy. But what I mean by that is, what boundaries do you know of that are very well defined? There's no mistaking about it. There's a line there. I know it. And this is that. And if you go past it, you're in a different region. Yes? U.S. border. U.S. border. Any political border. Okay? The border between Virginia and West Virginia. That's a well-defined boundary. 
legally defined boundary. I'm right here in Virginia. Here is the line. I step over into West Virginia. I realize I'm in West Virginia. I get the hell back to Virginia. Right? The well-defined line. Sorry to my West Virginia friends, all right? Now, that's political boundaries, and maybe homeowner boundaries, and plot boundaries, and survey boundaries defined. Most boundaries of most regions are actually fuzzy. And that is, there is no legal, we don't know exactly where the edge is. And the best kind of uh, examples of this are like climate or education. For those of you who saw the movie earlier, it should tropical rainforest, right? And we all recognize, well, that's a region, tropical rainforest. We can define it by the vegetation type. But if you were in the middle of a tropical rainforest in Brazil and started walking in one direction or the other, if you kept walking, eventually you would no longer be in a tropical rainforest. Maybe you'd be eventually be in a, a temperate forest. Maybe you'd actually be in a desert, all right? As you're walking through a tropical rainforest, maybe it's really thick and lush in the middle, but as you keep walking, the trees get smaller and thinner, and now it's regular trees, and now it's shrub, and at one point you're going to say, I, there's no more trees, I am not in the tropical rainforest anymore, obviously. But at what point is the edge? I don't know. That's fuzzy. That's a fuzzy boundary. So we know where it is over here, and we know where tropical rainforest over there, and somewhere in the middle is a fuzzy boundary where you have switched regions. And that brings us to the third main characteristic that everybody actually pointed out first because you're so smart. And that is every region needs some sort of homogeneous trait. Something that's the same here, that once you cross over the boundary, it's different over there. Who gets to define that homogeneous trait of sameness? Who defines that? Say, I do, that's right, I'm the teacher, everything I say is right. The observer, the user, you, the individual. In other words, all regions are user-defined. It's up to you. These are the regions that I create. Because when I look at the world, I say, oh, you know what? There's a whole bunch of stuff that's the same with the U.S. and Canada that actually is kind of different once you cross the U.S.-Mexican border. How many people agree with that, by the way? Yeah, most of it. Oh, yeah, of course. It's, it's, that's a political boundary, but it's a regional boundary. I don't even care about the politics and, uh, and the political boundary between states, I'm more interested in, there's a whole bunch of stuff I can say about Mexico that just does not apply up in North America and vice versa. Okay? And maybe a better example is Africa. Africa's a continent, but this part of Africa, the southern part of Africa, really different than the northern part of Africa. These two parts of Africa have nothing in common, except for next-door neighbors. Because we can look at the Middle East, or North Africa, versus self singer Africa and say, oh, wow, gosh, you know, we can look at religion, culture, language, history, trading routes, economies, uh, poverty levels, rich levels, we can look at all this up, and it's really different from those two regions. That's how I define it. This is my defined world regions. You may think of something different. You may define the world or any, or any region in it according to what you're studying or what you're thinking or how you interpret the planet. In fact, I've said that, let's play a quick game mode. What region are you in right now? North America. According to that map, we're in the North American region for this class. Okay? But so I'd say, we're in the America region. Yes, we're in a political body called the United States of America. Done. What other region are you in right now simultaneously? The South. The South. How many people think we're in the South? Oh, we're in the South. How many people are like, hell not in the South? Oh! User defined. Already, there's one thing. We've already had a disagreement on the third region we picked, all right? And that gets to the heart of it. It's all about what you think, how you're defining that region. Give me some other regions we're in. Appalachians? Might or that's easy. Appalachians? Maybe we're in the Appalachian region? We're in the Virginia Tech region. We're in the Hokie region, right? Yeah! What else we in? Northern Hemisphere, what do I hear about? The New River Valley. Most would agree we're in that region as well. Yep. Southwest Virginia. Burris. We're in Burris. Planet Earth. Planet Earth. Montgomery County. Blacksburg. We're in all of these regions simultaneously. Let's get back to the Southwest Virginia one, though. How many people are from Northern Virginia? 
Oh, is this is Northern Virginia in right now. Are we in Northern Virginia? Speaking of those boundaries, at what point when I drive north am I in Northern Virginia? Everybody's like, Charlottesville in Northern Virginia? No. Hell no, right? Uh, uh, is Winchester in Northern Virginia? No. See? This is far as you can get. And some people say no. Because you have to define what you think Northern Virginia is. You have to find the region in your mind with your experiences. Does that make sense? Here's why I've taken five minutes to explain the whole regional concept before we even start this class. I want you all to understand and know this. I don't know how I made a test question out of it. I couldn't care, right? But I want you to understand this concept. It really is up to you what you're looking at and how you interpret it. Okay? We also could have said that we're in a Christian belt. Someone say the Bible belt. We're in an English-speaking territory. You can start picking off all sorts of things. And the reason I point those out is because there are people in this room Southwest Virginia or in the United States and say, that doesn't apply to me. Ah, oh, that doesn't apply to me. I'm actually not English speaking and I'm Muslim. And I, and I don't think I'm Southwest Virginia either. And what I want you to understand is that's cool. You have to understand it's up to the user. And everybody has their opinions. And more importantly, we're talking about general homogeneous traits. In general, when we're defining the region and tell some lines around, we're saying, generally speaking, most people here are Arab or Russian or English speaking. Generally speaking, we know there are exceptions. This is going to come in particular play when we start getting to other parts of the planet. And I'll pick on one in particular. Look at that one in yellow. Call that Middle East. Everybody knows it's Middle East. You can homogeneous trait in the Middle East. Just right off the cuff. What do you think? Middle East, what do you think of? Islam. Someone says Arab, someone says desert. Sand. Oil. Camels. Camels. Wow. Islam. Almost everybody would look at that yellow log and say, yes. Obviously. That is a Islamic region. And that's a solid homogeneous trait. But there's some exceptions, aren't there? What's a major exception? Uh, Israel. A Jewish state smack in the middle of an Islamic region. I'm pointing that out because I know it. I know there are exceptions. There are always exceptions. I don't want to diss anybody. I'm not trying to offend anybody. We're making generalizations about gigantic parts of planet Earth. There are always exceptions. But we're trying to study the whole planet, so we have to make generalizations. We can't point out every exception and point out every person and every lifestyle and everything that's going on there. That defeats the purpose. It's how we humans actually organize knowledge. We very naturally do this. It's like, we can't know every single fact that would make our brain explode. We generalize. We know it's roughly like this here, and roughly like that here, and these people are roughly like this, and we think roughly like this, like that cuisine. It's what you do. Okay? And that's what we're going to do with this class, too. Knowing full well there's exceptions. Got it? That's the three components. Be able to regurgitate that for the rest of your life. Uh, having said that, now let's play a quick round of. Which time we got already? Woo! Dude, it is hot in here. I never get hot in here. You don't have to come back up, but I love you, sir. Thank you. Okay? Oh, not even water. Be, uh, uh, somebody get a Gatorade bucket and dump me here in a little bit. Let's play a quick round of. I was joking about that. Don't do that. Uh, I was going to say, let's play a quick round of where in the hell are we? So we're all on the same page of the regions we're talking about. I'm going to point out some things that you should know already from the textbook. You tell me what region is by name. So we all have a common vocabulary. Here we go. What's the green blob? <laughs> North American region. Now, I know you learned in fifth grade geology class that North America is a continent, and it is, and I don't give a shit, all right? For our class, North America, the region, as defined by me, is the U.S. and Canada, okay? If we head south from the North American region, what are we going to? Mexico. 
Mexico, or the Caribbean. Okay? And again, this gets to the heart of it. A lot of folks just say, oh, it's Latin America down there. It's all the same. I don't think so. There's enough differences between these parts of the planet that I want you to explore in a little bit more detail so you can understand the planet. If we head down further south from Mexico, we run into Central America. That's a very distinct term called Central America. It's tricky, but know it. Know it, live it, learn it, love it. You'll see it on the test. Central America are the handful of countries, it's actually seven, between Mexico and Colombia. It's always referred to as Central America and new stories and everything else. And finally, if we head south of Central America, we run into South America. South America. And that is a continent, and for our purposes, a region as well. That's the easy part. That's the Americas. We're used to that. Let's go abroad now. What's this blob over here? Western Europe. Western Europe. We're in Europe on the west side. And if we went east of that, we'd be in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe. And if we wanted to go to old Soviet territory in red, we'd be in Russia. Russia. All right? So Russia in red. And again, you'll see this through readings and stuff we talk about in class, that Russia is quite distinct from its Eastern European neighbors and definitely distinct from Western Europe. And also, speaking of distinct, Russia is a country, also a region for our class, and so is <laughs> Turkey. Almost everybody on the planet who's ever read a textbook counts Turkey as part of the Middle East. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. And to read the book, we have an electronic. You'll see why I don't buy it. And you won't be selling it either. All right? It's a very different. Like, it doesn't fit enough of the homogeneous traits of the Middle East to be counted in there. Let's go further afield. We've already pointed this out. What's in orange? Full on Middle East. Everybody recognizes that. And if we would go from the Middle East and travel across the Sahara Desert, and we were going south of the Sahara Desert, then we'd be in Sub-Saharan. Sub-Saharan Africa in yellow. Already pointed out big differences north and south in Africa. And finally, the Asian regions. These are the ones that confuse most students. Not sure why, if you know a compass roads and cardinal directions. Let's pretend we have a compass and we stick it smack in the middle of this, right in the center of Asia, in that green blob, what would that blob be? Central Asia. And if we went south of Central Asia to India, we'd be in South Asia. Stay with me, stay with me. I know it's tricky. Central Asia, South Asia. And then if we went east of Central Asia over here, we'd be in China, but also the Koreas, East Asia. And finally, we back here and went southeast, we'd be in Southeast Asia. You got it. Everybody got the vocabulary down? So when I say Southeast Asia, you know, I'm not talking about China, I'm talking about Southeast Asia. All right? One person away. It's the heat, though, I don't blame you. All right? Uh, and finally, actually, we've, there's a couple countries we are reasons we didn't point out who I missed here. Japan. Japan. And that one may be most the best example of it all. For reasons you'll discover if you talk to Japanese or Korean or Chinese people. Yes, Japan is Asian. Japan actually has more differences between mainland Asia than Mexico does in the United States. Believe it or not, we have way more in common with Mexico than Japan does with China. That's why I stick it off as a separate region. Yes? What about um, the half of the island? Like the warning there. That's not like Guinea. Yeah, I forgot about that. Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, and actually we'll go to a world map here. Papua New Guinea and these small islands off the Pacific are typically called Oceana. Uh, and because we already have so much to cover in this class, I kind of don't talk about Oceana. I'm sorry for all the Papua New Guinea fans out there. Is there anybody from Papua New Guinea that I've offended? I didn't think so, all right? <laughs> okay. Oh, and we also forgot. Kangaroo and Hobbit Land. Yes, that's what I've been feeling out there. Uh, quite distinct from Southeast Asia for their whiteness and nothing else, all right? So again, these are my world regions. You may define the world differently once you go out, research, investigate, learn more about what's going on. You may be from one of these regions and you still might think, uh, that's not how I see it. And I agree with you. You're from there. You have a different perspective. Okay? So this is the structure in which we're going to try to look around the entire globe 
and understand it all so that three months from now, you kind of get a little bit about what's going on pretty much everywhere, at least this much. Okay? Having said that, uh, what regions would you like to talk about first? Australia. Australia. Oh my God. Starting strong with all the middle east. Middle east. How many people try it? Middle east. Yeah. All right. What else you guys want to vote for? Russia. 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 Yeah. 
five biggest countries on planet Earth. Brazil being the fifth biggest, all the way up to Russia being the biggest country on planet Earth. Twice the size of Canada at number two. Cool? Now you see how the game's played? Let's play it faster now. Pakistan? Brazil. Back to Brazil? Indonesia? Back to the U.S.? Uh, occupation, someone says. How about active? 
limited U.S. military presence. The countries with the most American soldiers in them that ain't America. Uh, these are actually old numbers, but there's about 45,000 in Morocco, but that number is significantly lower now. 11,000 still in Kuwait. That number's actually going up. Germany still has like 50,000 soldiers there. That's like the best assignment ever. If you join the service, go to Germany because they fight them. They're just drinking, all right? <laughs> and they're drinking well. Uh, and Japan still has 33,000 American soldiers. South Korea still has 28,000. Can you think of any other country that has hundreds of thousands? Hundreds of thousands of their soldiers on other people's soil. Puerto Rico? I didn't realize Puerto Rico had such a huge armed force. Mexico. Mexico? No. The cartels? This is a full world map of U.S. military troops and bases around the entire planet. Pretty much at least a small troop presence everywhere, and a significant troop presence in lots of other places. Food for thought. Food for thought. Another reason that Americans should know way more about the world, because they're stationed there already, and they have been for decades. Well, let's kind of finish up our game here with a tough one. Uruguay. Uruguay? Wow! Right out of the box up against Uruguay. Eastern Germany was taken over by Western Germany. 
Germany, good one. We should watch a film about that. Sorry, got my pacemaker, all right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Germany was unified. We wouldn't say that West Germany took over East Germany. In fact, many people in West Germany were like, hell, we don't want them. Uh, but they did unify the entity. It went from two political entities to one. Great example, feels like a test question. I didn't know you guys were that clever. Well played. Can you think of any other places that have taken over and absorbed a sovereign state? Mexico. Mexico took over what? New Mexico. New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> I think that process is still happening, sir, but thanks for playing, all right? It's a slow takeover of the southwestern United States. Any other place? Burma. Burma? What do they take over? It needs to be taken over? Oh, being taken over by who? <laughs> Confusing me with your attention, sir. Yeah? Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1991. Oh, that's the one I was waiting for. It did happen in your lifetime, but you were probably wearing diapers, so you weren't paying that close attention, right? And that was the Iraq at one point said, we're going to take over this political entity named Kuwait. And what happened? Iraq got the shit kicked out of them for attempting to do that. That is our world. We all have to load this map, and all the states of the world kind of have this tacit understanding that, uh-uh, you don't do that. You can't do that. If the U.S. tries to take over Canada, hilarious, by the way, but if they did that, the whole world would be like, whoa, unacceptable. That's not cool.
you recognize Egypt, and Angola, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Togo, uh, Kenya, you all say, oh yeah, I recognize that one. Who drew those damn lines? Does anybody know? Europeans drew those lines. The locals can draw those lines. And if you start looking at the groups of people in Africa, where it's this group, or this tribe, or this ethnicity, it has nothing to do with political boundaries. Nothing. And there are groups of people who have common ethnic and historical qualities that are split between two or three different states because they can draw the lines. Okay? Sorry, I got a little off track, but that's what I love to do in this class. Okay? Back to sense. This concept is only a few hundred years old, right? And it kind of evolved in Europe with people who were fighting for territory for their clan, their tribe, who started to solidify things. And they would say, hey, hey, we're the Frenchies. Oh, we are the French. I have a bad debt to do this. And we live here in this territory. And we would draw a line around ourselves and call us all France. <laughs> and every time the Germans come, we will surrender, all right? <laughs> That's how you got the evolution of this thing we all identify and accept as the state. Okay? Now, here's what's important about this. Looking at this map, this map is color-coded. It's in your book, too. It's color-coded by how old the state is. What are some of the oldest states on the planet? China. China? China? Ethiopia, strangely enough, is what fix out. China. Iran? You guys are picking the eyeballs first. That's awesome. Uh, Egypt's not lit up. We're looking at the purple. Countries that have been states for at least 200 years. China, uh, Germany, Spain, Portugal, France, Great Britain, all the Europeans, and the United States. Let's stop there. Let's stop there. How old is the United States? 230. Probably 200 years old. How can we be one of the oldest states on planet Earth? When our eighth period is only 200 years. We jumped on the bandwagon. We jumped on the bandwagon early. Actually, that's a great answer. We jumped on this trend early. The Europeans were developing this trend two and three hundred years ago, and then we got pissed off at the Europeans, kicked our asses out, and said, well, that's a good system, though, we're a state. <laughs> so in this bizarre irony, when you look around the rest of the planet, there are countries that have been around forever. But America is an older continuous state than most countries on planet Earth. The Europeans are the oldest state because they invented the shit. America is in that category because we're an early adopter. Where else has been uh, in the old category because they truly have maintained their territory separate and distinct for a very long time? China, China you got already. Ethiopia also points out in Iran and oh, England. The UK, yes, we already got all the Europeans. Uh, Japan. Uh, Japan. These are all countries. Stay with it. These are all countries. I'm not talking about the Europeans we got. But these other ones which are kind of strange to us, like Thailand, China, Iran, Ethiopia, these are all countries which were never colonized. They were never taken over by any Europeans or anybody else. That's why they're in the old category, okay? They just got lucky, I guess. <laughs> the white Europeans didn't come and take them over. Or at least they resisted the to maintain their independence. Where are some of the newest countries on the planet Earth? <laughs> Russia? Is Russia one of the newest states on the planet? How can that be? Because they used to be the USSR. A whopping 20 years ago when you were born. And then what happened? They broke apart. They broke apart. Hey, that backs up the trend we were talking about, doesn't it? A single big entity broke apart into how many smaller entities? Anybody know? Christian! When the USSR collapsed, it created 15 new states. Russia being one of them. All of Central Asia used to be part of the USSR. They're new states too. They've only been states for 20 years. Many European countries were part of the USSR. They're new states now too. 
Where are the next wave of the new estates on planet Earth? Look at all of Africa. All of Africa has been a state only since 1960 or 1970. Why is that? They were colonized by the Europeans up to that point. And that's true for parts of the Middle East and parts of Asia. Many of these countries, they have an old culture. And people are there for a long time in old histories. But they had 100, 200, 300 years where someone else was in charge. They were not states in the modern context. Even places like India, all of South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the British controlled all that up until 1947. So they're only 60-year-old states. Most states are new. And what you're going to see in your lifetime reinforce is probably more newer states. As some of these entities break into ever smaller divisions, and Sudan, you see lit up in yellow, it should now be in red because now it's two countries, Sudan and the creatively named South Sudan. <laughs> Anybody know that already? Sudan, road part of the Sudan and South Sudan. They really should have got some more creative folks on Twitter to help them out with the name. All right? So does that make sense? This is a pretty damn new concept. Now let's get to what it is. What it all about. When we're talking about these things in a global context, you'll hear these phrases thrown out. So what we want to know for this class is, and for the rest of your life, what is a nation? What is a nation? What do we actually refer to when we say the nation? Versus a state, versus a nation state. These are actually three distinct things. And there are big differences between them, even though many people use them interchangeably. Okay? Which is wrong, but people do it anyway. I want you to be on the right side of these definitions. So we'll start with perhaps the easiest one. What is a nation? I've kind of tipped you off this a little bit already. Yes, sir? It's a group of people with a common heritage of some kind? We're back to people again, like I was making fun of the French. A nation suggests something about the people. When you hear about a nation, is it telling you where? Telling you, tell you boundaries? Is it telling you the, the context is it's as people. A nation is people-centered. That's something, common culture, common ethnicity, common religion, common something that this group of people are forming a nation. Can you think of any nations of people? The Hopi Nation. And what's the commonality there? Virginia Tech. Okay. That's a real simple one right out of the box. Japan. Japan. Distinct nation of people for sure. The Kurds, wow, some good ones. Any others? Yeah. Tibetans, Koreans. Arabians, Koreans, uh, Pakistanis, Chinese, Madagascar. Is there really a Madagascar nation? I don't know. Again, I'm telling you, I don't know. I don't know. All right. I get, I get really confused when it comes to African countries because I don't know. There could be three or four or five nations of people depending on what country you're talking about. Does this sort of make sense now? All the stuff I'm spouting out? So just in a general context for our class, a nation is a group of people, 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 who share a common culture and who might, emphasis on, might, want to have their own government and want to rule themselves. We can't make the assumption that just because they're a common group of people, that they want to be their own state or rule themselves. The Hokey Nation is a good example. I don't think we want to form a sovereign state of Hokies. That would be funny, all right? We can try. I don't think that's what we're all about, though. And again, to go back to Africa, there might be a Zulu tribe in their ethnicity. I don't know. They're there. Some of them are in South Africa. Some of them are in Lesotho. I don't know if they want their own state. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Maybe there's some people in Quebec, Canada, who are Quebecois. That's their culture. That's their people. Some of them may not want to have a separate state, but obviously some of them do. So we can't make the assumption that every nation of people actually wants to be something more. But it's all a people. Okay? As a poet, well, actually, we should give some examples you already have of the Kurds and the Cherokee usually comes up as an Indian nation here in North America. Uh, and if you went around the world, what you'll see is that lots of places we identify the state itself 
with the people so strongly that it's hard to separate them. Do you think of a nation of people and the Germans a good example? Now, oh, the Germans! We drink beer, we eat pretzels, we start wars, alright? <laughs> Common ethnic bond. German! Just so happens that it's German. And the Frenchies, right? Oh, they surrender. They're in France. <laughs> They're there. And actually, if we start to go around all of Europe, isn't pretty much every European country based on a nation of people? The Finns in Finland, the Swiss in Switzerland, the Italians in Italy? Although that's a slightly more troublesome one. Yeah, I wonder why that is. Why is that every European country? It doesn't guess question. Why is every European country associated with a nation? Because they developed the concept. There you go. This whole idea of state and nation state is wrapped up, and Europeans are the ones that started it. So obviously, most of the lines they drew, they were like, yes, we're with all the Finns over here, and you Swedes stay on your side. You're Sweden, we're Finland. You're, the Switzer stayed on there. You're Switzerland, where you live. I don't know if there are Switzer people, uh, but when you put the word land past something, it usually means the people of this land. Okay? People are here. Uh, by the way, go to the question too. We say Finland, the land of the Finns. Okay? Switzerland, land of the Swiss. In Asia, particularly South Asia, if you see the word stand after a word, Pakistan, Kurdistan, Uzbekistan. I wonder what Stan means. Land. It's the land of the Uzbeks. It's the land of the Pakistanis. Okay? So anytime you see Stan, start with land. It's these people are here on that land. Alright? Yes? Good. On we go. So you have the Germans, another great example that you guys pointed out already, the Japanese. Exceptionally distinct group of people. I know this is hard for all of us on this side of the planet to understand, because we're not Asians. We're not from Asia, well some of you are, but we're not from Asia. We haven't studied Asian history very much in this country at all. We don't know virtually nothing about Asian culture except we go to Chinese restaurants and shit, all right? <laughs> That's the extent of our knowledge of Asia is what types of food the people eat there, apparently. But do understand this, Japan is quite distinct from all the countries around it, as I pointed out. Culturally, historically, ethnically, Japanese people ate Korean people. And they ate Chinese people either. And don't confuse any of these people with each other because they'll get really pissed off. You say, hey, you look at all these Korean people. I'll say, hey, what's up, Japanese folks? You're going to get your ass kicked, all right? You may not be able to tell the difference. They can, and they know. That's the way it is. Very distinct, separate group of peoples. And actually, we could go Japan, not quite distinct. Korea, even more distinct. When you go to Korea, it's 100% ethnically Korean people. That's it. If you're not Korean, you're a visitor. You don't live there. On the Korean census, you know, we fill out the census every 10 years. Of who are you? Uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, what's your ethnicity? What color are you? All that shit. On the Korean censuses, uh, check one of these boxes. Your ethnicity is one, Korean, two, get out. All right? That's <laughs> it. Korean. Distinct. Culture, people in that part of the planet. Uh, other places, they haven't fared so well because they have lots of different groups of people, lots of different nations within a single state. You could look at a place like the former Yugoslavia that had nations of Serbs, nations of Macedonians, nations of Bosnians, nations of Croats. And people decided to draw a big line around and say, oh, no, you're all one country. Look how well that worked out. Great. Put one in the wind column, per se, collapse. Okay? We're getting speeding into the trend of, there we, the trend today is that a single Yugoslavia has broken down into six or seven different sovereign state countries. Yes? But it's not religion, but everything else is You're talking about Bosnians? Uh, yeah, uh, this is perhaps not the best example to use because this is like the biggest chaotic mess on planet Earth. So for people from the outside to understand it, all they can say is, uh, okay, 
We went in and asked people questions. And we went in and said, what do you identify yourself as? Are you Bosnian, Herzegovinian, Serbian, Montenegrin? And there'll be some people like, ah, I'm Muslim. A Muslim ain't necessarily a nation, but in this circumstance, in this part of the world, it's what people self-identify. So it is to them. And again, us as outsiders, what's so confusing about Yugoslavia is you look at this map and it's like, oh, why did this place go to civil war? Well, this helps to understand why bloodbath happened here. But even in Bosnia, you know, there was Muslim Bosnians and Muslim Herzegovinians and Catholic Bosnians and Catholic Herzegovinians. And you know, it just makes your head explode. You're like, ah, it beats the shit out of me. It's a bunch of white people killing each other, right? That's all we know as outsiders. They locally say, uh uh-uh. uh, just like Koreans or Japanese. Well, we know the difference. We're from here. And we are different from that group of people over there. Sorry, I belabored the point so much on this, but another one that we will get into into some detail in this course, because it's going to be a hot zone again very soon, is the Caucasus Mountain region. If you don't know your world map yet, it's the Caspian Sea over here, the Black Sea over there, and there's Russia up there, a place called Georgia, here's Turkey down here in Iran. So that puts it in context. And this is a patched work quilt of nations of people, and it's a hotbed for conflict. Because in this circumstance, there are nations of people who say, we do want to be separate. We're not Russians, and we're not Georgians either, and we don't like being ruled by other people. Just understanding this concept of nations goes a long way of getting you to understand, oh, that's why they're pissed off here, and that's why they're fighting over there. Okay? That's part of it. Not always all of it, but it's part of it. All right, but let's get on to the more interesting one, perhaps, and that is state. So if a nation's about people, what the hell does that mean for a state? We've already now said there's 195, 196 of them. And the reason I'm being uh, coy about picking an exact number is because it's kind of changing. There are lots of different places on the planet that are applying to become a state. Some of them may have already become one. Okay? There are other places that are likely to become a state, and they're in the process of becoming a statehood. So by the end of the semester, it is going to be 197 states. I just want you to roughly know, just under 200. Okay? That's how many states there are. Okay, that's how many. What the hell is it? What would it take to make one? We have 10 minutes left. Damn, how did that happen? Let's make a state right now. If there are entities that we all recognize on planet Earth, and we all have an inherent understanding that yes, I'm from the state of the United States. Canada's Canadians are from the state of Canada. We all get it. What is it? What do you need to have one? And in doing it, let's make one right now. Let's pretend I want to make a state. Because I do, actually. I really want to make a state. And if we as a class can make a state by the end of the semester, everybody gets A's for that too, all right? Or, and I'll throw this out, I don't want details, if a group of you can at any given point take over a sovereign state and raise the Boiler flag, you also get A's for the class as well. I don't want to know about, I'd say the easiest target is Vatican City, it's only about as big as the drill field, all right? <laughs> there are actually more people in this room than live in Vatican City, just so you know, we already outnumbered them, all right? And they wear funny hats so they're easy to identify. Okay? What do we need to make a state? Let's make one right now. And what do you think states have that everybody needs? Abandoned oil, man. Abandoned oil, middle of the ocean, yes. Land, we need land. Land, yes. So I want to say this stage is our land. You know what? This room is our land. Let's make it the whole damn room. We're going to take over, occupy Paris, and make it into the state of world region. So we got land. What else do most states have in which we're A government. So well, I will appoint me as king for life. Yes? Agreed? Okay, then. Done. I'm king, all right? And you know what? To appease you commoners, I'll let you hold some elections, and you can form a parliament over here behind me, all right? So now we have a government. What else should we get? Money. Money? I'll print off some money with my face on it. That'd be fun. Sounds like an extra credit project for next week's class. Yes? Infrastructure. Infrastructure like 
Like what? Like or your college, military. A, a military? I, is anybody in here going to join the military? Show of hands, military folks. You're all going to be forced to join the military of the state of the world region. Spoiler alert. All right? We now have a military, and they have weapons, so we're good to go. So I can bring a bunch of dudes up on stage, and ladies, with weapons, and we're good. So we now said we need an economy, right? So we'll have some sort of economic activity. Maybe I'll bring a bunch of ladies on stage, and we'll have some sort of economic exchange. <laughs> Our money that we made will trade some shit, yes? And what else, sir? Go in and kill your own people? Maybe we need to kill our own people. <laughs> Hold on to that thought. Yes? Some of recognition. Now you get to the top ones, yes? That's right. I mean, a constitution and some rules and laws. We can make all that shit up. No one said the obvious. We need a flag. A flag. We need a flag. Because we have a flag and plaid and we plant it, then we're here and it's ours. Did you notice the states always do that flagship? Britain shows up on the shores of India, a country at the time with a half a billion people, roads, infrastructure, money, and economy, all these people, cities running around, and they put down their flag and said, this now is ours. Why? Flag is here. Crazy, and I'm just making up arcade nonsense from history. What's going on right this second, right now? I'm going to piss off my Chinese friends, but know this for an exam. Is there's a bunch of islands called the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. Write that down. South China Sea. There's a group of islands. It's rocks. They're not even islands. Most of them are rocks smaller than this room. And a whole bunch of countries say, that's our rock. And in an effort to fully claim the rock, China sends pregnant women out to it and gets them to squat down and have babies. <laughs> Under the assumption that citizen is a citizen of this rock, and it's a Chinese citizen, therefore this is China. <laughs> Where else does this baby belong to? He's a citizen of the rock. <laughs> and it's Chinese, so it's ours. Sound asinine? So it's putting a flag on something, all right? <laughs> Ours! Remember the South China Sea? It's a group of rocks that countries may go to war over before the end of this semester. A group of rocks. Rocks. Uh, the Spratly Islands. Spratly. S P R A T L. E one? Yeah. I'll say E. L E Y. No E. No E. Next to E. Save the E for Iran and Iran. Alright? Got it? Okay. Where the hell are we going with this? Oh, that's right. Where do we need to have a state? Somebody already said a couple different things. Someone said you need recognition, and someone else said we need to kill our own citizens. We need a mascot, we need women, what? Uh, here's the deal, here's what you need right now. You actually do need the ability to kill your own citizens. That's the answer. You really don't need money. You don't need a flag. You don't need a constitution. You don't need any of that shit. You don't need an economy, you don't need military. All you really need is the legal ability to kill the people in your state. And if you, if you can do that, and other states recognize your ability to do that, then you are a state. That's all you need. The rest is window dressing. Let's keep our example here. What happens if I kill somebody in this room? I learned we have an economy, money, military, borders, Land, a constitution. What happens if I kill somebody here? Revolution. Maybe a revolution. I would prohibit that. All right. What would happen? I would lose tenure. That's an excellent answer, sir. I love that. Although the tenure system is 
pretty strong. I don't know who definitely did it. <laughs> if I were to kill somebody in this room, I really don't have ultimate authority over this lane to do that, do I? Who would come and get me? The police. The police of? The Maybe the VT police, or Montgomery County police, or Virginia State police, or United States police. All of these entities supersede me in power. Now, why do we pick killing somebody? It's not for dramatic effect. We pick that intentionally because that's the ultimate test. It's the ultimate test. Because if you can kill your citizens and no one else can say or do anything about it, can't you pretty much do everything else? Can't you tax them and jail them and boss them around and make them do stuff? You can do everything else. Death is kind of the ultimate. And if you can do that, it's assumed you can do everything else too. And if no one else can mess with it, you are a state. Everyone else on the planet recognizes that you have that ability and they can't mess with you. Okay? Now I'm taking an easy example because it's silly. Let's pick a real, real example. Let's pretend that President Barack Obama has an executive directive and launches a nuclear weapon at New Jersey. We don't know what you mess with us. I'm not saying China's bad, but you should understand when you see 
political place in the UN whatsoever. China and Russia both say no intervention in Syria. Who cares if they're killing their own people? That's what a state does or can do. Okay? Having said that, I know there's questions. I'll, of course, love to answer questions on stage here for as long as it takes. Katie wants to play the video of the shout outs that we will now be sending out there, ready to send out to Planet Earth. Let's see how it turns out. Can we bring out the house lights? Too? Oh, actually. I'm a humble professor of geography here in Virginia Town, home of the mighty Oakland Central Park, and the hardest working university in the great state of Virginia. Today, I'll be teaching a class on the Great Lakes Region and the Great Lakes Region. 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 Great Lakes